Thanks everyone for coming. Um, today's session is uh, about all of the ways that you can increase your food enterprise's income by growing your customer's average basket value. Um, and your customer's ask average basket value refers to the average amount spent per customer per, per transaction. And if you haven't worked this out before, which I'm kind of assuming that probably most of you have, if you haven't, you work it out by dividing your total revenue um, by the total number of orders placed. Um, and a bigger average basket value normally means better margins. Um, and for example, you're getting extra income, but without extra outgoings or like extra delivery costs and things like that. Um, so taking steps to increase um, your average basket value is a really good step to take to your food enterprise. Um, and to help with this, uh, today we have some really brilliant guests um, who are going to be sharing their experience, expertise, approach and ideas uh, on this topic. Um, and we're going to start by hearing from Sarah and Rachel from Tamer Valley Food Hubs, and then we're going to hear, I don't know, and then we're going to hear from James from Stroud Co. And then we're going to hear from Louise, who'll be kind of wrapping things up with um, some slides showing all the different ways that you can use the Open Food Network platform to support your average um, customer basket value goals. And then we're going to have a nice Q and A at the end. So we'll probably have about ten to fifteen minutes um, Q and A. And um, if you have questions in the meantime, when people are, are talking, then please feel free to um, write them in the chat so that we can um, like get to them at the end. And also the chat's kind of an open space as well. If you want to write in there any questions or any comments or any thoughts, then we can get to that at the end, but also you know, supportive, um, nice comments for, for, for the contributors is always really nice in that space too. So. Um, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Sarah and Rachel from Tamer Valley Food Hub. And thanks so much for, for agreeing to join us today. Um, and they've done some great slides for us, so I'm going to put a treat. I think you're still. <laughs> I'm Rachel, and this is Sarah. She's not really small, she's just social distancing. She's just socially distancing from me. Um, try and make this full screen. Um, so yeah, we we put our heads together and um, had a bit of a chat about what's um, helped us grow order values um, since we've been running our hub, and they're pretty varied and um, take various amounts of time of input and effort to to make the baskets grow. Um, so we've kind of scrubbed them down into some slides. Um, so without further ado, um, because no one gets bored of seeing pictures of beautiful strawberries, um, we want to talk about uh, seasonal kind of highlights and usually when we have strawberries arrive on our food hub, um, I think there's very few people who don't add a punnet of strawberries into their, into their basket. So um, seasonal um, highlighted products, especially ones that are specific to our local area. Tamar Valley is very uh, famous for strawberry production growing. So it's a big product for us every year. And we um, shout about them arriving on the hub on social media and in our newsletters. Um, and it just reinforces perhaps that, um, you know, we'll be bringing the freshest strawberries to customers. Um, got some lovely imagery around them as well um, that we've gathered over the past few years. So um, yeah, we, we make a big thing about seasonal products. Other ones for us throughout the year, asparagus, new potatoes, daffodils, pumpkins. Um, we get a big increase in honey sales when it's just extracted in honey season. So really fresh honey. Um, that we can supply to customers or apple juice, you know, in the autumn, stolen buns at Christmas, all those kind of products we try and um, make a big shout about every year. Um, and we find that really helps and most people do add these things into their baskets. Um, so seasonal is really important. I um, also wanted to talk about um, considering selling higher priced produce on your hubs. Um, we're just starting to look at alcohol. We're in the first steps of um, getting our licenses. Um, it is quite costly to set up. Um, I think 
just the training and getting the licenses is costing us about 250 pounds and then there's the additional effort and admin of getting a premises license as well um so it's a big step we've been talking about it for years years <laughs> and, um, but there's a lot of um local gin producers in our area now uh, a few microbreweries that have popped up and we think it will be a really good valuable addition to our food hub offer um and obviously a big area and market for us to to, to tap into so we're giving it a go we'll, we'll feed back on that one later on the year of how, how our alcohol sales have gone but um it is something to consider because it's quite an administrative burden and it's going to have operational changes for us in the way we deliver potentially um so it's something to consider um but the timing of it needs to be quite good and i think we've got to the kind of number of customers now where, where when it's worth us doing it and we hope we can kind of get back our setup money at least this year. Um, but also on high, higher pro priced produce, um, we also offer things like boxes of beef, um, half pigs. Um, we also do fish boxes. So being able to have individual items is obviously really important, but just having those items in the background for boxes and beef. We don't sell a lot of them, um probably one or two a month but they're there and it's another kind of choice for for the customer so the other thing that we do is we um regularly get asked you know why don't you stock so and so and um if our wholesaler essential actually carry it then we sort of like will um, order it in and list it on the basis that if that one customer wants that product, then it's very likely that there are other customers that want it as well. So it's about encouraging um, feedback. We've got a feedback form on our website, having a conversation with customers through our social media, um, answering little notes that people write to us on their orders and understanding the hooks that bring people into shop with us. Um, sometimes, you know, customers will order when they need a certain product and having that, knowing what their hook is and what else they might want to buy um, alongside that hook is really helpful. Um, so, it's all about incre continually increasing our range of produce and being a serious alternative to a supermarket shop um, and being different to the rest. You know, it's uh, just some good old fashioned customer service, like a customer rings up on a Friday morning and said, is there any chance of any potatoes? Like, no, sorry, we haven't got any spare. But then sending the delivery driver off to somebody's Stall, roadside stall that we know might have potatoes, buying them some potatoes at that stall, putting it in their shopping, and they get a nice surprise in the afternoon that they've got some potatoes. You know, this is somebody who's shielding and wasn't going to go out for potatoes anyway. So those sorts of um, flexibilities are really important as well. Next slide, please. Go through. Oh, that's about flexibility. Yeah, so... Um, so we are as flexible as we possibly can be. Um, so lots of different ways to pay, accepting order changes and amendments at the last minute, either on the phone or email or allowing customers to do it themselves, giving them the option of putting in more than one order. Um, so we have an option for a second order this week. Um, giving people the option to share a delivery with their neighbour or friend. So we deliver two people shopping to one address. That's a, a really good bonus for us as well. Um, and subscriptions for people who say, you know, who, who want the same product every week or fortnight. And so we set that up for them um, as a subscription so that they don't forget. Also being responsive and um, during um, lockdown one, somebody offered us um, their outside barn as a new collection point. 
and we responded to that and had it set up within a week and all of her neighbours sort of like use that collection point um, and as you know we've they've stuck with it ever since as well so it's about listening to your customers responding to them and then telling them that you've responded to them so customers who have said well I don't want my paper invoice anymore and it's like okay how can we go paperless with invoices and which we managed to do and then that customer was chuffed to bits that you know she thought that the comment that she made actually made us change our whole process um offering choice is um big for us um we think we've got all milk options covered now, yeah. <laughs> which is uh, the list you see in front of you um it's got longer and longer through customer requests quite a lot um but it also apart from milks um it also kind of you see it in other parts of the hub where for instance we offer a six pound non-organic seasonal veg bag um up to a 16 pound certified organic veg box from a certified um producer um so we try and include um a varied price range where we can as well to encourage um people with different price spend levels that kind of thing so and and to make it more accessible for people so um we can encourage people who haven't filled their basket with us yet to fill their basket with us <laughs> um hampers. hampers i'm doing hampers <laughs> hampers basically chance to sell a lot of things in one go bingo and you um, actually help the customer then to, for, you know, a present for the uncle that sort of like, they don't know what to buy them for. We send them at Christmas, we send them by courier at cost as well. So that's not a lot. You don't find that a lot with a lot of um, hamper providers. Um, and they're easy. We also recently done a project with a big, um, or a big corporate recently, who um, instead of their swanky black tie awards dinner, um, wanted to give the awards winners a fifty pound voucher from Tamar Valley Food Hubs, which we set up with them. So we, you know, basically sold at least fifty pounds worth of produce to um, I think it's about 30 award winners. Do them, you can do the maths on that one. And um, hopefully they'll become customers in the future as well. So that's another thing that we're gonna look a lot more into for Christmas because a lot of big corporates like to reward their staff at Christmas as well. Next slide please, Rachel. Oh. <laughs> So um, again, in the links to choice is offering um, bulk items. So we do five kilo porridge oats, um, rice, that kind of thing, um, five litre bio D products um, and take customer requests on, on bulk items. It's something you can add in really easily to our, our range um, of whole foods that we get from essential trading. Um, but we also do um, the reverse of that in non-bulk where we buy in who gives a crap toilet rolls um, at, by the box and we sell them singly at the price that the customer would have to buy a full box for to get that good price. So it's quite a nice um, offer for customers who either don't have the cash flow to buy the full box or, or to store it at home because they're pretty bulky. So it's just... Uh, another way of getting people to um, add in items to their baskets. Um, uh, Non-food items we've, we have made policies about. So um, I think it's about knowing your boundaries about mm, things that aren't um, food. Um, our boundaries are items that are either food themed or Tamar Valley specific um or both um will sort of like will we'll accept on the hub 
Um, also items that will help to support our projects. So for example, when we can get back to putting on fundraising events, we'll send sell tickets for those events on the Food Hub um, to try and help support those projects. And also having free items, like there's a local um, area of outstanding natural beauty magazine, which we get a stock, a box of, they give to us for free. We put them in people's boxes and then they can order them as a free item to come with their shopping as well. And um, I was looking at the figures when um, looking at our basket spend. And um, one thing that struck me was have a pandemic. <laughs> There's nothing like a pandemic to increase bar basket size. Um, so unpacking that a bit more, our basket size went from about £30 pre-COVID to £40 post-COVID um, lockdown. And we've attributed that to a lot of different things. So um, a lot of producers were coming to us where their markets had just disappeared. So hospitality had disappeared. They couldn't do um, food fairs anymore. And they came to us um, as a way to sell online. Um, and so we increased our range. Over uh, the last year, we've probably increased our range by over 50%. Um, so ever increasing your range and because producers were quite grateful for our help they've stuck with us as well so they, ha they have gone back to their old markets where, where they've been able to um, but they've also said well you know we'll still keep supporting you because you supported us at the time. Um, one just um, industry standard that I was looking at when um, I was talking about thinking about doing this um, webinar was that it's actually five times as much to acquire a customer as it is to retain one. Um, so what would you rather do? And um, just some little quotes from some of our customers who discovered us during um, lockdown one. Um, little old Jean, I've never eaten so well, she said, um, when, <laughs> when um, she uh, gave us some feedback. And um, for another housebound customer, um, this has literally been a lifesaver for me. Uh, and our last slide is about our newsletter. And I know there's... Uh, talked a lot about newsletters in the webinars, um, but we send our newsletter that's um, created on MailChimp every Friday evening at 6pm when we open our food hub. Um, and we get a really good response from customers um, seem to buy the new products that feature in the newsletter each week. We definitely get a kind of noticeable kind of uptake of those new products um, so it's a really important tool for us um, we hook people in to read the newsletter by it containing the contents of what will be going in our seasonal veg bag each Friday so that's kind of people open it to find out that and our subject line wherever possible starts with new this week strawberries sea buckthorn juice <laughs> whatever it is that week um so every friday we try and either have the newsletter about something new or something returning to the hub that's in season or we'll have good stock of um and it yeah it's it, it is a really important hook for um increasing basket size for us i think so yeah that's a whistle. That's, that's a whistle stop of our <laughs> baskets. Awesome! Thank you so much. Um, there's so much packed in there, and yeah, really lovely to hear as always your your customer feedback as well, Sarah. So thanks for sharing that, and thanks for sharing all of the awesome things you're doing. And those strawberries have made me 
when you want strawberries now. So, <laughs> um, so uh, now we're going to pass on to James, if, if that's OK with you, James. And oh, just want to mention as well, if anyone has any questions for Sarah and Rachel, um, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the, the end, um, end of the session. Sorry. Oops. OK, uh, hi there, everyone. I'm uh, James from Stroud Co. Stroud Co is based in Stroud, uh, which is in the centre of Gloucestershire uh, and is quite a uh, well known for a, a its um, farmers market and also the number of growers and so on that there are in this uh, lush part of the world. So it's a good place to be uh, operating from it with a local distribution of locally uh, sourced foods. So I'm uh, going to take the next 10 or 12 minutes or whatever it is to more or less say exactly the same thing as uh, <laughs> Rachel and Sarah, because what they've hit on uh, is the range of different points from working with suppliers to making sure that the customers know what you're doing and listening to the customers when they say anything, asking indeed for their feedback uh, in survey form or research or just collecting their thoughts online or whatever it might be and responding. And all of the um, points that uh, have been raised are very much the sort of thing that we do too, uh, in order to maintain and hopefully grow the basket size. Um, I'm gonna get into a couple of other details as well, um, but I'm sort of assuming that everybody here or everyone that may be listening to this on a uh, subsequent uh, release, uh, are uh, running a, um, a business effectively, uh, which they want to and they want to survive and they want to pay their bills and they want to generate turnover, which largely they can feed back into the local economy. Uh, and if those things do apply, um, then th this uh, call to how you might be able to increase the basket size uh, will very much be re uh, relevant. Uh, I'm not going to produce any slides, so you'll see a bunny picture of me throughout this. Um, and obviously, uh, if you want to sh shut me off, that's up to you. Uh, basket size, we've touched on it as to what it is. Um, it's a fairly mechanical tool. It, it, it's um, largely common sense as well. And it, obviously, you have however much you bring in in turnover through the, that number of orders with that number of customers. You divide one by the other and you get the right answer. But I'm not sure that's really the whole story because um, I think uh, basket size is a, a measure which really is at the heart of what we're doing. And it's certainly something that everybody should be acutely aware of because if it starts going down, then uh, you know there are, there's something not quite right. Uh, if it maintains itself at more or less the same level or, of course, goes up, then you do know that things are going well, and that is largely going to be because you've done something to make people want to use you more than they have before. So it's a sort of measure of your popularity and also potentially your role in the local uh, food sector. Um, because if you're taking more and more of the food buy in that area, then obviously you're doing something right and someone else is is uh, I suppose losing out, but what you're trying to do is is um, is obviously working, and it acts really as a guide both to the uh, customer side. So obviously they're the people making the purchases, and if the basket size is going up, then they're making that decision. Uh, but also the supplier side, because it's got to be driven by what there is being offered, uh, uh, you know, to the customer base, and as a result, it directly affects your ability to trade effectively um, you know, efficiently effectively and, and uh, generate more for the local area so as well as shaping your reputation and your social capital and so on uh, it is obviously at heart about how much each customer spends with you so you can do this um, look at this over the course of any period it can be a week or a month or a year or, uh, or longer or repeat it uh, regularly and looking to see how it changes is is extremely uh, useful indicator as to what you're 
is how you're getting on. Um, so if, if I can sort of resort to a little bit of ethereal maths in the air and just picture in your mind's eye, if you can, whether you're numerate or, or not, um, 10 customers, and those 10 customers together spend 200 pounds in your first week of trade. Uh, you've therefore got an average basket size, 200 divided by 10, 20 pounds. Now, probably half of those customers are spending way below 20 pounds, and probably half of them are spending considerably above 20 pounds, and that's what makes it come out at 20 pounds. In week two, if you've done your plotting right, what you're trying to, uh, what, what you would like to do, you know, not necessarily trying to do, but what, what you would like to do is to say, for example, that those exact same 10 customers are now spending 250 pounds between the 10 of them. Uh, and what that might be is that either everybody has, um, oh, I seem to be going a bit fluttery here. Uh, is everyone able to hear me still? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Okay. That's a bit of a kind of bitchy video thing, but I, but we can see you and hear you. Yeah, I don't know what that's all about. Whoa! <laughs> um, uh, you can still hear me. I seem to have frozen that as well. I'm all a bit annoying. All right. Um, the uh, where were we? Yes, we've now got ten customers spending two hundred and fifty pounds, and that might be because each of them has spent maybe a couple of pounds more. Or it might be that one customer only has suddenly decided to spend a considerable amount more, like 50 pounds more or something. But the net effect of that, however it's been done, is that now your average basket size has gone up from 20 pounds to 25 pounds. And if you can then maintain that at 25 pounds, uh, then you're obviously going to be doing considerably better than you were uh, at the 20 pound level. Uh, and even so, uh, it, it, however it's done, you're in a, you're in a stronger position uh, with the 25. <laughs> I might have to shut this video off, might I? <sighs> Try it again. Um, okay, there we go. So there's a little bit of uh, math just to keep you going. Um, what looking at the um, at the figures, which I do every week i quite like stats and i quite like looking at how these things all add up and it, it, they are the facts that kind of under underpin the business um we have a, a very uh, a kind of top hat uh, whatever this type of a hat is a kind of peaked cap system with how much people are ordering so there's a lot of people who order five to ten pounds worth uh, each week a lot of people are doing the next sort of band 10 to 25 or so and it, and it crescendos at about 50 to 55 pounds. And then it starts to decline again at the other end. But there are people who spend 100 pounds or more, even this week, 200 pounds or more. And, and there is no particular way you can determine how much somebody is going to spend. However, if you keep track of the figures, then you can see that this happens on a very frequent, not necessarily, uh, sorry, a very regular, not necessarily frequent, but a very regular basis. I think part of the art of running uh, any food distribution company, or any company, is to is to try to understand a bit more clearly as to what it is that's making the customers a come to you and b buy that particular uh, uh, sum of money. So if um, if you're able to shift people up in their bands, then that would be a good way of increasing the the, the basket size. So how do you do it? That's all very well in theory. We've had some very fine ideas from uh, Tamar, and as I said right at the start, we do a lot, if not all of those, uh, as well. But I, I think there are a couple of kind of general points that one can can say. Perhaps the um, first one would be increase the number of suppliers, or at least uh, ha have a wider spread of suppliers, because whatever happens, people like to buy everything that they want in, in as quick and efficient a way as possible. So that's obviously why supermarkets got off to such a, a, a sort of flying start and have, have retained that. But with us, it's not hugely different. If, if it, you know, if you're required as a customer to keep, to go to 25 different places to pick up everything you need, then that's probably going to count against you. So 
offering more with more suppliers definitely makes sense. And working with those suppliers, I think, is a totally crucial aspect of this. So working with them probably winds up with, work, with, with offering more of a range from each supplier. So what you're doing is gently growing the number of suppliers and the number of products that each supplier supplies. Uh, and of course, it's much easier for an existing supplier to uh, to bring more or to, to offer more of what they can offer you, because there already there's already a system as to how that's ordered from them and how you get it from them on on a given day per week, whatever it might be. Uh, adding a new supplier has its complications. You've got to get them sort of on board and then work with them to make sure it works properly. And sometimes it doesn't. Uh, you know you try very hard but it just doesn't work terribly well um so keeping with your original supplies making um improving or increasing the range with them is definitely a good uh, good thing to do more customers that's not immediately apparent as to why that should uh increase your basket size but i think it probably does uh, and it's because people talk and people uh, you know, want to do the same as someone else, or they want to, they hear about what's going on and, and they like the idea, they may not have heard of it directly before. So I think the more customers you have, the more networking capabilities there are, the more likelihood there is of sales pickup, and, um, and that all adds to the basket size. Uh, obviously, if there are particular items which are your, your renowned for or you, or you have a kind of uh, easy way of supplying the milk industry is, is sort of fits into that category as from what Tamar was saying they've obviously got a range of 2,500 different milks um, and we have a quite a wide range as well and that does as, as, uh, help the people come because of the different uh, varieties of milk which they cannot get so easily elsewhere so more suppliers more lines with those suppliers more customers i think all helps but what have we actually done um well we increased the suppliers from around 20 when we we've been going for about 15 years altogether but my knowledge stretches back about five years when there were probably something like 20 suppliers and there's now more like 30 some come some go some arrive some unfortunately like one just today or yesterday we're going to lose after a long period of uh, service with us uh, and uh, that's going to be a, a bit of a blow trying to find a replacement um, for that uh, they've, they're stopping completely i'm not quite sure why so it's a bit difficult to know, know. um but increasing those suppliers and then increasing the number of lines with each of those suppliers has definitely been a, a strategy we've, we've adopted increasing access to us for people who are vulnerable people who are still vulnerable than a year and a bit later than when the pandemic started um yes the pandemic has been uh good to us if that can be said uh, but it is still happening there's no question there are still a lot of people out there possibly older people more likely but still people out there who do not want to go back out into the streets and uh, you know are really keen on a service like this and i think one of the aspects that we can say we benefit from and i hope that's the case with everyone on the call is that local food translates to local service translates to trusty trusted uh, trustworthy and of course if you respond as sarah and rachel said to incoming inquiries and sort of respond to questions that uh, are put to you as a very local service then i think you're going to earn a lot more trust and that really does assist in, in breaking into uh, sort of parts of the community who, who might otherwise be a bit less than willing to to come out and show themselves so increasing access to people who are less uh, robust is is good we've also added facilities which uh, might not initially appear a reason for upping the basket, but I think also they have a, an effect. And one of them is we've uh, teamed up with a local bunch of bicycle delivering uh, deliverers. So they're called the bike drop, and uh, and 
they've now been working with us for a couple of months, I think, and they did last summer as well in the height of the good weather. Um, but so first of all, that's extremely eco and green, and that goes down well. But secondly, it does mean that people can order a bit more if they were habitually either going to collect the. We have a collection facility. Uh, a lot of people use that. If if people were going to do that because they didn't have a car or because they didn't like cars, then um, the bike drop option means they can order more and the bike drop does it in any case. So the, the, those sorts of aspects sort of you add on facilities are uh, quite good at uh, assisting the, bike, the, the um, basket size drop. Definitely increasing social media and newsletters. Uh, we send one out every, every week online. It's a lot more social media action. Uh, I don't participate in that, um, but uh, I'm aware of it and it seems extremely uh, positive. And of course, uh, it's the instant way of getting messages out and that's, uh, that's extremely helpful these days. Pushing the seasonality aspects, absolutely. It's definitely one of the things that local should mean to people. You know, you get what is growing and you don't get what doesn't grow. And if you do, then you've probably got it from somewhere far off. And that's not um, not what we're about. And growing new partnerships as well. So I've, I've mentioned sort of specific items, but unusual items, we, we do a lot of homemade uh, food these days. Uh, so that tends to be from small local kitchens, uh, often restaurants that have been struggling and you know need to find a new outlet for their uh, kitchen products. Um, alcohol and juices have been uh, a big seller as well. We have a great brewery in Stroud, the Stroud Brewery, which um, I'm sure you may have sampled its Whereas wherever you are, it's, it gets all over the, the, the country, but um, obviously it's a huge uh, boon to the town here. Um, other aspects, I suppose, of, I, you know, the risk of repeating myself or <laughs> repeating others uh, are to do with bulk buying and non-foods and so on. But I, I just point to the other aspect that uh, there are certain times of the year, Christmas is the biggest one, Easter not far off the second, but any kind of school holidays at the moment, clearly, you know, it's much more tough with schools not operating quite the way they were, people being a bit more hamstrung and having to stay at home. Those sorts of things definitely are also moments to offer the services uh, in a friendly way, which means that uh, people should, should pick up on them. Uh, and then I'll just say a couple of, I don't know quite what the timing of this is, but um, I'll say a couple more things if, if I may. Um, one of them is uh, something we call a buddy scheme. Obviously everything is done online and pe some people, older people in particular aren't that familiar with uh, technology, the technology. So we have a, a good number of customers who don't live anywhere, uh, sorry, the recipient lives obviously in our area, but the person who's placing the order may not, they may be the, uh, you know, the son or I say son, they're probably in their 40s or 50s or their daughter, but, uh, uh, you know, they place the order, they want their mother or father or aunt or whoever it might be to get good food regularly. Therefore, they may well be inclined to um, order more than that person might themselves go and buy. And uh, yet the system works pretty efficiently to, to sort that out. And that is something that we've noticed uh, uh, quite a bit over the, the epidemic, the pandemic. And then vouchers. Vouchers is the last one I'll mention. It has its sort of slight problems in OFN. It's not quite as straightforward as one might want, but um, we're working with that. The uh, um, principle being that if somebody can buy, a, a, you know, give you a voucher or give somebody a voucher for 20, 30 pounds, whatever it might be, then that will make it considerable difference to the overall cost and it might even start people from that to start looking at uh, the food hub in a, in a more general uh, generous way um, and uh, our aim really is to be able to offer vouchers to particular uh, people who've either assisted in, in us over the long term to get to where we are or 
local NHS workers, whoever it might be, people who might otherwise find it you know, less affordable and who want to be able to access the local food that there is in abundance around here. Over and out. Awesome. Thank you, James. Um, that was a really yeah, lots, lots of lots of lots of things to think about packed in there. And I really like that you brought up um, the idea of, well, first of all, it's really interesting about the bike delivery. So that sounds like a yeah. very cool draw for people. So yeah, I think you have to have uh, been training for a bit to yeah, yeah not offering your services. <laughs> Cool. So thank you. Um, and just thinking of time, if we can move on to Louise, if it for your section, that would be awesome. And then we'll have a Q and A. Thanks, Louise. Sorry, I couldn't find you on mute then. <laughs> a bit of a panic. Um, yeah. So Kay and I got together last week or so, and we had a bit of a brainstorm about um, ways, marketing ways, and using the platform ways to maybe increase your basket spend or maintain it. And um, these are some things we came up with. Um, it's not moving. Oh, there is. So um, one of the ones that is probably we've all seen everywhere, um, lots of different um, businesses do it, is offering a direct reward for people spending over a threshold amount. So something like free delivery over £50 or um, spend £50 and get a small discount. Um, so if you're going to offer this uh, as a business, one of the things you need to do first of all is determine what that threshold is going to be um, so that you don't make a loss on it, I guess. Um, so if we, if we go for like uh, offering free delivery, you need to take into account the cost price of actually getting or doing that delivery. So the petrol, the mileage, the staff time, et cetera. And then you want to make sure that the margin or enterprise fee you're getting from that basket size is going to um, cover that cost. So you're not out of pocket. So this is um, our whiz through the mass, but um, just a basic example that if you had an enterprise fee of 20% for your um, business and a cost price of delivery was two pounds, then you're talking about a threshold of baskets needing to be above £45 to offer free delivery without making a loss. Um, offering um, this the free delivery or discount um, above a certain basket spend is quite easy to implement with the OFN. Um, it, and we'll share these slides afterwards and there's links in the slides to the user guide to um, how to do this. So I won't bore you with all the details, but you can use something called the price sack fee calculator. And in here you can set your threshold limit and the amount for someone would normally have to pay, um, say if they didn't spend that, and then the amount they would get um, that spend, they would pay for delivery if they spent over the threshold. And similarly for payment methods, um, what you, you can use the price sack calculator. And bear in mind, if you're going to use this, um, it's a a value amount that you'd give back and it would, you could say it was um, and put in a negative value so it would be like a cash back system where um, spend 50 pounds and get a pound back um, it, you can't offer a um, percentage off at the moment just bear in mind if you're going to use this that um, there's it, just the thing to note about the setting the minimum amount on the OFM platform um, this is a formula to work it out uh, just to include your enterprise fee should your hub um, add enterprise fees on top of the product costs. Um, and again, this is all in the slides and in the user guide, so I won't bore you with details. Um, I think it's always good um, to sort of look at your products with a critical eye and it, it, the easier it is to shop. The more people are going to buy um it's, it's quite as simple as that and um obviously they're not necessarily going to buy just because it's easy to shop but you want to make it as easy as it is it could be to shop and um i'm sure as hub managers you probably look at your shop front loads and loads and you probably um the more you look at something the more you can't see what's right in front of you so um it's always worth maybe asking a friend or a neighbor or a spouse if they can take a look at things every so often and just do a review for you as well. Um, 
it's surprising that even when people have shopped on with you, your food hub, that um, for a long time, or maybe they're a new customer and they haven't, they've been shopping a couple of months, that maybe they don't know or haven't used the search bar and the filter buttons and they literally just scroll through and then get bored and can't be bothered to put things in their basket. Scrolling through has the advantages that people might spot things that they want and then pop them in that they sort of impulse buys. But maybe every so often, maybe once a month, once every couple of months, do a social media post or put it in the end of your newsletter about how to use the search and filter buttons um, and fields on the platform. And then this is going back to the secret shopper idea. Um, these are just some things to double check with your the products that are listed. Um, the products are listed typically created and maintained by your suppliers, not your food hub. So just check things um, are in the right product category. I mean, this is a really extreme example, which I cocked up for, uh, cooked up for you, where I put eggs into the alcoholic drinks, which is obviously wrong. But there might be some more subtle things that you don't think is quite logical and you ask and want to ask someone to change. Another thing that does come up, and I've seen it as a support team member, um, customers, shoppers have got in contact with us about things to do with this, is the product properties and the search terms. The search bar um, field at the top of your shop will search um, products based on name, whereas the filters on the side um, filter products based on product property, and they're two different entities um, attached to a product within the platform. Um, so in this example, if I type in organic into the top of the, um, uh, into the search bar, it comes up with apples, veg box, pork and eggs because they're the products that have got organic in the product name. But then if I, um, it, instead of doing that, I click on the certified organic filter and these are the products where the producer has added the certified organic um, property to them, I come up with slightly different products, um, apples, raspberries, coffee. Um, it, it's really good to just do a double check and make sure that everything marries up because as a shopper, um, I would trust the certified organic button above like something that was written in a product title, I think, oh, it says organic, but is it really? Um, and it's the same product, it's just making sure that all your, um, you dot the I's and cross the T's on all the products. Um, and that's just something to think about. Another thing with product properties is look for inaccuracies as well as omissions. So this one again is a really extreme example and you probably would never see this in real life, but a, a meat pie listed as vegan, but something that has come up um, that I've seen people shoppers comment on is um, where products are listed as gluten-free by accident and they're not gluten-free. And I think these things really do matter, especially with customer confidence. Um, in terms of reviewing your products, it is good, this is really glad to see that, um, it, well, really interesting to hear that Tamar and um, Scrauco mentioned this as well. So sort of having lots and lots of low value items on your shop front is not, necessarily a good thing because it might encourage people just to put you know just to buy a bottle of milk for 50p or something and that's their total basket spend um so there's different ways to um get round not having really low, low value items i'm really sorry i don't know who that is um i just um okay <laughs> Um, I think I, I think it's going to go off again. Sorry. Okay, no worries. That's fine. Um, what? Um, I know what I can do. Hang on. Okay. All right. I think that'll solve the issue. Um, so, in this example. Um, we got a, a cake um you won't want to offer like individual cakes um especially for um people who might live on their own or that they only want to buy one at a time um but in this example if you buy four you actually get a slight discount on the the cost um, per unit 
Um, but then this is common if you go into the supermarket or anything else, you'll see that a sort of a 200 gram jar of sauce will be one pound, but a 400 gram jar will be three pounds. So it, it encourages you to buy more. But then there's moral questions that are related to this, such as um, you encouraging food waste uh, by getting people to buy more than they want. And also the other thing about um, if you've got uh, you're disadvantaging single people or uh, people who don't want to buy so much or those who haven't got so much disposable income and need to buy um, things in uh, more regularly in uh, smaller quantities. They can't just buy something and stick the excess in the freezer because they don't have the disposable cash. Uh, one way around this is to group low value items into bundles so that um, the customer is getting the same value for money. Um, and we commonly see this with veg bundles and you have bundles for one person, two people, et cetera. But you can think outside the box. It doesn't have to be um, veg. It could be cakes, it could be meat. Um, it's interesting that um, it, it, Rachel and Sarah mentioned fish boxes and meat boxes and stuff as well. Um, at the moment, just um, note that all of the products in a bundle would have to come from the same producer on the hub. Uh, in terms of logistics, that would be the simplest way to do it using the platform. Um, and then it, it, when you're doing your product review, just remember, I know that we've talked a lot about um, increasing the number of products on your, plat on, on your hub um, is a really good way to increase product spend, but having a product which is, um, not very well listed or inaccurate can actually do the opposite. So um, as a, a hub manager, you don't have to list the, add all of the products that a producer supplier adds to the platform to your shop front. If it doesn't meet up to your standards or you think it's gonna be detrimental or they've added like 20 um, products that are all under a pound each um, or something like that, you, you can be selective. You can always ask your suppliers to edit their products, and if they don't have time, you can ask them for permission for you to yourself to do it. Um, and uh, there's some links in the slides here. So there's a webinar that Kay and I did a while ago um, on optimizing your shop front and how to write a great uh, product description. And um, Kay really mentioned this and. Uh, it's a marketing tip and I, I read some more and I, it's, it's really amazing the statistics on it, that rewarding customer loyalty, not specifically directly rewarding customer spend, um, it, can, it will, will increase your basket spend over time. And as a community enterprise, I think it's really nice to support people who are loyal. Um, they might not have as much money and therefore can't always spend more, but um, if they can do as much as they can. Um, so um, ways to support customer loyalty is that, um, yeah, the loyalty card idea is out there. It's like it, it ubiquitous. We, it, people have got um, supermarket loyalty cards, they've got coffee shop loyalty cards. I know a lot of local shops around me do loyalty cards. I just wonder whether probably is already, food hubs already do do for loyalty cards, but if it's not something you do, it might be something you might want to do. Um, and there's all very, there's advantages of going paperless, but there's also something nice sometimes about having something tangible in your hand. Um, and uh, you could offer like a loyalty card, a piece of card, um, and then stamp it mark on the back every time someone collects their shopping. Um, and if they collect 10 times, then they get a, a little reward. And having something tangible is um, a physical reminder of your food hub. Um, a customer can pin it to their fridge, they can pop it in their, in their wallet, and when they go to the checkout, you know, they're uh, buying something else, it's not food, they, they see it, it reminds them to place their order. And as a shopper, they can check and say, oh, next time I'll get a reward because I'm, I've done nine. It's, it's something they feel in control of. In terms of rewards, there's lots of different things you can think of. There's things like um, an early bird shopping hour, 
which uh, my, the example I came up with to mind was strawberries again. So it's funny that Rachel and Sarah came up with that too. I was just thinking like um, if it's peak strawberry season or just the start of strawberry season and they're in high demand and they sell out really quickly, then offering your loyal customers as um, a reward to access your shop front an hour early and get in there before things sell out is a really nice thing to do as a reward or you could offer like um, a discount off your next week's shop or you can liaise with your suppliers and see whether they can um, they have excess of a product that they want to get well get rid of or they have a new product that they're happy to donate as a reward and then um, all these type of things they might give the customer a, um, a product that they've not tasted before or not tried from your hub before and makes them think outside the box and think oh I didn't know I could get that from my food hub I always got that from the supermarket and next time they might put that in their basket as well as their normal shop and then finally um, just a just a, two other things I thought of was that if you were going to do a QR um, a loyalty card you can always put um, a QR code or print that on the, the card um, and that would take the customer directly from their piece of paper to your online shop front and um, there's quite a few business and printing companies out there that do really cheap um, business cards banana print being one uh, but it's also you can be a canny shopper yourself and um, if you scroll for the internet you're there's always offers on and um, it's always worth having a look so I hope I haven't spent too much time but I know that now there's a bit of time for questions and answers possibly I don't know <laughs> Um, thanks, Louise. Um, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. We have slightly overrun, but I just think that's just so much awesome information. Um, so thanks. So thanks for that. And yeah, um, rather than going to the questions in the chat, because there were a couple and I know a couple from you, Louise, I'm going to go straight and just see if anyone, anyone here has any questions that they want to kind of open up and ask into the space in the couple of minutes we have. James? Is that me? Is it? Yeah. Um, I, it's not questions so much as just a couple of reflections on uh, Louise's points there, which I thought were really uh, interesting. Um, just a quick point on on the ordering of goods on online. When suppliers upload um, the goods online, then obviously it's a bit more random as to what how they do that and and what what order they put the words in, for example, unless it's very strictly organized by yourself um, we've tended to do it ourselves for the following reason is that a lot of the uh, goods are ordered alphabetically and if you don't put the same word in right at the start then you're going to get the word the word you know the alphabet um, alphabetical system of all the products that are in that section then kicks into play so just a word of warning to put the word biscuits or cookies or something as the first word and then at least the next word alphabetically ordered will be under the cookies bit of your section that's one point the second one is um is the multiple order um point that louise was talking about uh which is that in our case and i suspect with a couple of uh, in in others as well um we do multiple orders like your four current buns or whatever it was in that example you gave more to assist the supplier so that um, who quite often want to have a minimum order before they'll deliver for free or they charge a delivery charge and that might counteract the amount that's being sold so uh, it, it, there's you don't necessarily only put the multiple order on multiple purchase on to try to uplift the purchase it's also to assist the supplier to uh, make it a good um, yeah, amount for them to deliver. Great, thanks, James. Um, just to say to everyone, it is now half past. So if anyone needs to go, including the wonderful speakers, that's fine. Um, I'm happy to stay for another like four or five minutes if um, anyone has any other questions that maybe we can help with. But again, like if anyone needs to go right now, that's absolutely fine. Um, does anyone else have any? So just. Yeah, just uh, but if anyone has any other questions or anything that they want to, um, any points that they want to make for the, about the session, that would be awesome.
Uh, Rachel? Um, I just, I like the idea of the newsletter. How do you decide who gets the newsletter? I mean, how, you know, is it your, is it your um, customer list that everybody that registered or can you put it onto Facebook or something like that or what? Um, with the with the newsletter, I think that would be going out to a mailing list, and there's lots of different ways to kind of grow a mailing list. But um, after the session, I'll send you a link to a webinar that I did that is like everything I want around setting up a, a, a mailing, getting started with a mailing list. Okay. Uh, thanks for your thanks for your question. Uh, but I've got exactly the resource for you. Um, also, just if, uh, another kind of interesting thought was something that Louise brought up and um, just about the idea of the morals around um, basket spend. And I thought that was quite an interesting one. And I, I guess that's a question that I'd like to ask um, James and also Sarah and Rachel, if you have any thoughts about that topic. Um, I don't think I phrased that very clearly. I think <laughs> that, that was the point you're making is to try to make people spend a bit more than they might want. Yeah, or is that the point, Louise? I think it was um, maybe you brought up the, the thing about um, bulk buys and and yeah. So I, was I think it's, it's maybe spend more than they want or um, it, it specifically rewarding people for spending more, the kind of um, I think it's it I always take advantage of it if I can like spend over a certain amount um and get free delivery but is that really the is it always the right way to go um I don't know um I, I think it's it's not a simple answer is what I'm trying to say and I I, I don't I don't think many some food hubs don't use it and maybe that's reason why and I just wonder what uh, what people thought we don't really use it to be honest we do the only time that we offer it uh, is in the point i said a couple of minutes ago but particularly from the brewery the brewery uh, originally only only would deliver x amount for free and if it, uh, above x amount for free and if it wasn't that then there was a bit of a delivery charge so in order to ensure that we were able to make use of that we we had we sold the beers in twos or fours uh, and ultimately in cases as well I, I sort of we came to the conclusion that people should be able to make that judgment call themselves because they can immediately see how much it costs on the basket so it's not as if it's hidden or anything uh, and i think we take the view that that's down to the customer really uh, but we don't have a system that you're probably alluding to which is if it's more than x you don't pay the delivery charge we it's a flat rate for everybody yeah, I mean, we, um, we, as long as suppliers are happy to offer two for a lower price, I think that's the other thing as well. The, the difference with supermarkets is that it's always the producer that will pay for a bog off um, offer, but not the supermarket. So, I mean, there's that moral aspect of it as well. Um, and I think in terms of bulk items, we'll just sort of like do a, like a five kilo bag of lentils as opposed to a one kilo bag so you know it sort of like gives the customer um and it's something that will last them and that they'll use so i think we approach that in a fairly moralistic from a very moralistic standpoint So I realise that we've gone over by five minutes. So just thank you so much um, for yeah for coming in and, and agreeing to speak. And I think the recording is going to be um, super useful after the session as well. So um, for everyone that came, um, we'll be sharing the slides uh, into the Facebook event pages so you can see and make use of any of the links. And also that's where the recording of the session will be as well. Um, I just want to check, um, Sarah, Rachel, is it okay if I put your slides into the slides that I share? Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's great to see everyone and I hope this session was useful for us all and hope to see you at the, the next one. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.